dinosaurs in the Bible? Are dinosaurs mentioned in the Bible? I was just talking to a Christian friend of mine yesterday about what I was going to talk about today, and they had never thought of it. Are dinosaurs in the Bible? And many people think that the subject of dinosaurs is in conflict with Scripture. I've even heard some uh, professing Christians say things like, well, I think Satan just put those bones there to confuse us, <laughs> to tempt our faith. Like, no, I don't think that's the case at all. There really were dinosaurs, and it matches with Scripture. So today we're going to talk about dinosaurs and the Bible, and next week we're going to talk about the flood and the conditions that happened during the flood and the things that happened during the flood and how it produced what we see today. So you want to make sure that you don't miss that and uh, think about what you hear and whether or not you'll be able to use it as and conversationally with other people when it comes to things about the creation versus evolution and science. Our position here is that we're, we're not against science. We're for empirical science. We just don't think evolution is science. And I think I've uh, given about three hours worth of information so far on why I don't think evolution is science. So today we're talking about dinosaurs and the Bible. Textbook here says, no human being has ever seen a live dinosaur. How could he know that? Did he talk to you before he wrote that? Did he talk to Adam before he wrote that? Now, wouldn't you have to have talked to every human being that ever lived in order to know that? Yet they just put this stuff in the textbooks. The Bible says that God created the heaven and the earth. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is. Well, if that's true, Adam must have seen dinosaurs. He was created on the sixth day along with all the land animals, including the dinosaurs. Last week we talked about the Garden of Eden, where God said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. And by the way, everything we've done so far is on YouTube. So if you want to refer that to some of your friends, and uh, today we forgot the camera, but we'll put the audio with the slides on YouTube, so it'll still be on YouTube. But... God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters and let it divide the waters from the waters. And the firmament is the air, the canopy of air, well, the air that the birds fly through. And there was a canopy of water overhead and water underneath the crust of the earth. The Bible says, the earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof for they that dwell therein. For he hath founded it upon the seas and established it upon the floods. And we talked, this is review from last week. For those of you who remember last week, to him that stretched out the earth above the waters. Psalm 136, 6. The original creation was a lot different than what we see today. And the timeline that we're following is what you see at the top of your screen. 6,000 years ago, we had creation. God created the heavens and the earth. 4,400 years ago, there was a flood. Before the flood, the average age of man was 912 years. That's a long time. I know some of y'all are waiting for Grandpa to kick the bucket so you can get his will. Matt? Imagine waiting until they turn 900. Okay. Today, most people live to about 70 or 80 or so. One textbook says, The biggest pterosaur flying over inland sea is a pteranodon. Like all reptiles, it grows throughout its life. Dinosaurs were big lizards that lived with Adam and Eve. Di reptiles grow their entire life. And the question is, were there dinosaurs on the ark? I kind of have a problem with dumbing down the ark story down to a kid, because a kid will see these little pictures with the big animals in a small little boat, and then when he becomes 18, 20, starts going to college, he's going to start thinking, there's no way that little boat held all those animals. <laughs> okay, it's just a little kid's story. Even some Christians, when they get asked, here's Billy Graham, were dinosaurs on the ark? And uh, he says, uh, nope, they were all extinct before the flood happened. Really? Now, what's his basis for saying that? The biggest question, really, though, is were there woodpeckers on the ark? <laughs> you might have some problems if you had some woodpeckers on the ark. I think I saw this floating around in an email a couple of weeks ago, too. Kind of jogged my memory a little bit. So dinosaurs on the ark. Well, first of all, Noah was 600 years old when the flood happened. 600 years old in an age when people are living to be 900 
He's probably a pretty smart guy. He probably figured out that you don't have to bring the biggest one you can find. You bring two babies. Just make sure you get a pink one and a blue one, because that'll be important later. After all, they're there so they can reproduce later, right, and fill the earth with more animals. So why bring babies on the ark? Well, first of all, they're smaller. The biggest dinosaur egg ever found is smaller than a football. And if you bring the small ones on, you have more room, right? And if dinosaurs are growing to be the size of 14 school buses stacked on top of each other, which is pretty big, from the size of smaller than a football? Don't you know that they probably had to be living to be about 900 years old too? Or maybe a little older? I know there's a, there's a sea tortoise, or sea turtle, in the Sea of Japan right now that's over 500 years old and the size of a Volkswagen, right now. That sea turtle was alive when Martin Luther nailed his theses on the church in Wittenberg, Germany in 1517. Still alive right now. It's kind of interesting. They grow to be huge. So the biggest one ever found is smaller than a football. So Noah's pretty smart. He figures out, don't bring the biggest ones you can find. So why bring babies? They're smaller. They weigh less. You can carry them on a boat a lot easier. They eat less. You know, kids eat less than adults. And they sleep a lot more. You might want some little ones sleeping instead of chasing the kids around. They're tougher. You know, kids fall down and they get back up and keep running around. We adults, we fall down and we lay there for a while. <laughs> okay? Kids are a little tougher, a little more resilient. After the flood, they would live longer to produce more offspring if you bring two babies. That's why you bring the little ones. And probably he brought babies of lots of different kinds of animals. Okay? And the Bible says, And of every living thing of flesh, two of every sort, thou shalt bring onto the ark, seven of some, to keep them alive with thee, that they be male and female. And I notice this word kind here. And they, every beast after his kind, all the cattle after their kind, after his kind, after his kind, after his kind. Starting about 1729, we started using the word species. But the Bible terminology is a lot more broad than that. Okay? Also, one of the limiting factors is all in whose nostrils was the breath of life, as Genesis 7.22 says. Sometimes you've got to keep reading your Bible to get the more details. Some people say, you tell me that Noah brought every species of everything on the ark? The Bible doesn't say that. It says, all in whose nostrils was the breath of life. Do insects have nostrils? No. They breathe through spiracles in their exoskeleton. Holes in their exoskeleton called spiracles. So Noah did not have to bring every variety of dog. He just had to bring two of the dog kind. And all the varieties that we see today probably had a common ancestor. It was a dog. <laughs> okay. Not a whale or a hamster or a tomato or an amoeba. It was a dog. We have a dog at our house. His name is Frisco. Here he is with Sean. He is a canardly. You say, what's a canardly? Well, you can hardly tell what he is. <laughs> so he's a canardly. <laughs> okay? I don't have a problem with uh, the idea that many of the horse kind had a common ancestor. By the way, the evolution books have this one wrong because they have the horse kind, they have a certain intermediary losing ribs and then gaining ribs and some other things. They're just going by homology. They're not looking at the genetics of it. But a horse and a zebra having a common ancestor, I don't have a problem with that. Some of them they can, meet, they can mate today. Same kind of animal. So some skeptics say, how did Noah fit all those millions of animals on the ark? Well, first of all, it's only land animals, no fish. Okay? Didn't have to have any fish tanks. They're just outside. And we talked a little bit about that last time, about the salt water and the fresh water and how they can adapt. And only those with nostrils, so no bugs. So some people, some flood depictions show all these bugs coming onto the ark, you know, like Noah has a, has a Madagascar hissing cockroach farm right there. On the, that would have kept me off, I think, you know. <laughs> That's why those guys drowned in the flood. They saw all the bugs and didn't want to get on the boat. So there's no bugs because they don't breathe through nostrils, and the Bible specifies he brought babies, that's just common sense. He would bring two of each kind, not of every variety or species. So you wouldn't need a Great Dane and a German Shepherd and a Chihuahua. If there were Chihuahuas back then, he probably would have left them off the ark anyway, because the Chihuahua is a useless animal. And so God made the kinds. God told Noah how to build it. 
he should know how big. He should know how big it would take for all the animals to be there. So how many were there? They speculate there are about 8,000 kinds of animals that had to go onto the ark. So skeptics say, how could Adam name all those animals in one day? He probably could have done it in just a few hours, not even talking very fast. So how big was the ark? Well, the length of the ark is given in cubits, and there are some different measurements given for cubits throughout the Bible. And some, we have an Egyptian cubit, 20.65 inches. The cubit is about from your elbow to your fingertip on a normal person. But uh, every once in a while, it changes based on whoever the king is at the time. So sometimes a cubit can change. But the Egyptian cubit, one of the suspected ark sites, just happens to be exactly 300 Egyptian cubits long. Hmm, isn't that kind of interesting? The ark was a little bit shorter than the Titanic. It was uh, almost twice as long as a football field. So the evolutionist timeline has life appearing three billion years ago from a rock. From a rock. Here's the evolutionist life verse right here. Saying to a stock, thou art my father, and to a stone, thou hast brought me forth. That's exactly what they believe. They came from rocks. And the earth was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. And God looked upon earth, upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all the flesh had corrupted his way. And so he told his boys to go for wood. Now, gopher wood is not a type of tree. If you were to go to Lowe's or Home Depot right now, you could ask for plywood. Plywood does not come from a ply tree. Okay? <laughs> Some of y'all know what plywood is. That's good to see. Some people aren't, aren't just playing video games still. But uh, gopher wood is not a type of tree. It's not a type of wood. It's the way you make wood fit together in grooves when you're building things so that it's leak-proof and doesn't come apart and so it makes it stronger. So here's the timeline. And you could imagine our fax ad. Anybody name their kid our fax ad? Can you imagine him as a five-year-old? What's your name, our fax ad? How do you spell that? I don't know. Nobody knows. <laughs> okay. So Grandpa Noah, how come we're the only people in the world? Where is everybody else? That's where he would explain the flood. The flood happened, and there are over 270 flood legends and counting. Now, this information here is a few years old, and there's, I think there's over 300 now. But there's one from Hawaii, where long after Kinuoana, I think, <laughs> the first man, the world became wicked and a terrible place to live. There was one good man left. His name was Nuu. He made a great canoe and a, with a house on it and filled it with animals and water, came up over all the earth and killed all the people. Only Nuu and his family were saved. Does that sound familiar? Hmm. Yeah, kind of. What about an uh, ancient Chinese classic called The High King Tells of the Story of Fu Hai, whom the Chinese considered to be the father of their civilization. History records that Fu Hai, his wife, three sons, and three daughters escaped a flood, and his family were the only people alive on earth. After the great flood, they repopulated the world. Does that sound familiar? By the way, it's interesting. You know the Chinese language is a pictographic language? And did you know that the word for flood is a pictograph of eight people in a boat? I thought that was kind of interesting to learn that a few years ago. Here's one of the Tolik Indians. The Tolik Indians, ancient Mexico, they believe that a flood came 716 years after the creation. That's only about 60 years off from the biblical timeline. So where do all these flood legends come from? Probably because there was a flood. 270 flood legends, probably because there was a flood. There's a Babylonian flood, flood legend. The Bible says that the flood settled in the mountains, plural, of Ararat. And that's the, that would be the area of Uratu, Urartu. And the, the Turks, the Turkish people, they call the place Nuan Gumshi. And that means Noah's big boat. That's the name of the place. Okay, the Turkish people don't have any problem believing in Noah's Ark. And the Ark rested on the seventh month and upon the mountains of Ararat. Notice that's mountains, plural. Might not necessarily be on Mount Ararat, but in the mountains of Ararat. There are four theories about the location of Noah's Ark. It could have been taken apart and the lumber used for buildings. That would be the smart thing to do. It may have rotted. It's still on the mountain. It's still in the valley. 
Could be any one of those. By the way, I think that after the flood, I think maybe building houses that would float might have been a fad for a couple of hundred years. That's just my theory. So I think maybe some things they find might be some things that were built after the flood because people might be afraid there might be another one, even though there was a promise that there wouldn't be. So here's Mount Ararat. And down in the valley, there is one of the primary locations where people think the ark wound up. And even the government of Turkey said, this is Noah's Ark, and they built, a, they built a visitor center there. If you go up north a little ways to Glen Rose, Texas, Dr. Carl Baugh, he has some folks in there. They have a drawing of an eyewitness who says they saw it on Mount Ararat, and they actually have a drawing, and they have a big painting that they made. And both, both theories, in my opinion, are extremely interesting. I like to listen to them both. They find all these stones around the area, iron rivets that might go with a boat. The length of the ark shall be 300 cubits, and the breadth of it, and the height of it. So there's these stones, the drogue stones. They find them all over the region. 4,100 kilograms. All right? You bench press that and let me know how it goes. <laughs> okay, and then there's these curved holes drawn through them. What they used to do with boats, big boats, is they would put drogue stones on them. And the Noah's ark might have had drogue stones, and that would provide stability so the boat wouldn't tip over. And it would also turn you into the waves so that you wouldn't flip over as well. One, uh, one atheist told a creationist, he said, I heard your seminar about Noah's Ark having big rocks hanging over the side. You're so stupid. Don't you know that if he had rocks hanging all over the boat, it would slow him down? That would be bad for all those appointments Noah had to make. <laughs> you know, you got to keep that itinerary. And then there's this big debate over about the length of Noah's Ark. Say it couldn't have been 300 feet long because masted ships that are wooden don't last if they're 300 feet long. Well, it wasn't a masted ship. It wouldn't have the mast to pull and tear it apart. Some scoffers talk about a wave bending it. The Ark might have had a moon pool. Might have had a moon pool. This moon pool would uh, be a stress relief for a long trip. For the, for the shape of the Ark, it would provide more air circulation. You know, with all those animals on board, you might pray for a good wave every now and then. Okay? And it would be a good place to dump refuse. So it might have had a moon pool on it. Lots of theories about how the ark might have been built. If the Bible is true and man lived with the dinosaurs before the flood, what happened to the dinosaurs? We know what the textbooks say. You know, a meteor came 65 million years ago and killed them all. So a scientist from Indiana has even suggested the startling theory that the dinosaurs killed themselves with their own flatulence. That's not a joke. <laughs> they really believe that. <laughs> they had global warming up to the point where they could not stand the heat and they all died off. You know, maybe there's some other reasons they died off. Who knows? So what made the dinosaurs go extinct? Maybe they're asking the wrong question. Maybe the right question is, did they go extinct? You see, the liberals are always good at getting us to argue the wrong premise. Uh, for instance, should creation be taught in public schools? Maybe the right question is, should we have public schools? That's a discussion we'll talk about later, some other time. Dinosaurs leaving the ark faced a new world and a more hostile climate. Many probably died from the climate changes within the first hundred years after the flood. Remember we talked about the size of the nostrils not being big enough to support the large size of those reptiles. So the average age of the flood was 900 years, and then after that, they kind of start to die off a little bit. Then it becomes 400 years, then it comes down to 200 years, and then finally down to 100 years. They start to die off, and if that same thing was happening to the other animals, they would not be living to be so old, and they would not be growing to be so big. So many of the dinosaurs died after the flood due to the climate changes. The second problem was worse. People hunted them. There are lots of legends of people seeing or killing dragons. By the way, the word dinosaur was invented by Sir Richard Owen in 1841. If you get a dictionary that was printed before 1841, it will not have the word dinosaur in it. Before that, they were known as dragons. Even today, we have the Komodo dragon. We, know them as, we call them dragons sometimes. But they wouldn't call them dinosaurs back then. They'd call them dinosaurs, or they'd call them serpents, flying serpents, sea serpents. Serpent is a word that doesn't just mean snake. It encompasses the whole kind of the reptiles. Even in 1891, after the word was invented, the word dinosaur was still not in the American Dictionary. The word dinosaur isn't there. The Bible talks about dragons a lot. 
Their wine is the poison of dragons. Thou breakest the head of dragons in the waters. Dragons are mentioned at least 34 times in Scripture. There's a 1946 dictionary. Here's a definition of dragon. Now rare. A huge serpent, a fabulous animal, generally monstrous, just calls it rare. Now today we say they're extinct. In 1946, people writing the dictionaries thought they were rare. Well, something else that happens to dinosaurs, as human population grows and it expands and goes into new areas, what happens to all the big ferocious animals? <laughs> they all get killed or driven off, right? What do you think would happen if the local news came on tonight and said there were some great grizzly bears running through Colleen, Texas, and they need to be stopped because they're harmful? What do you think would happen? Probably, probably the first five rednecks that you know would be out there with their rifles shooting the thing, and he'd be the hero. <laughs> he saved the town from the big bear. What do you think would happen if there was a dinosaur coming through town? It'd be the same thing. You'd be the village hero. You'd kill, you'd kill the dinosaur, and you'd be the hero. A lot of them probably just died for that reason. Why would you want to kill a dinosaur? Well, uh, they have meat. You could feed the village for a while on some dinosaur hamburger. They were a menace. You could be a hero. You could prove your superiority, competition for land, and you'd be surprised, maybe, how many ancient recipes for medicine and food call for dragon parts, dragon skin, dragon blood, dragon tongue, dragon eyes, all kinds of dragon parts in ancient recipes. Why do you think they would say that? Probably because they were using them, okay? Guys, you ever go to the grocery store and something's on the list and you just can't find it in there? Okay? Am I the only one? All right. I'm just saying, if you put dragon blood on there, I'm not bringing it home. <laughs> I don't know where to find it. Here's Gilgamesh slaying a dragon. Why would the Chinese have 11 real animals and one mythical one? What about these ancient... I don't even know what to call them. <laughs> these ancient artwork, ancient displays de depicting dinosaurs. Depicting dinosaurs on their artwork. All over the place. Here's a tusk from the 12th century. Looks like it's got a dinosaur on there. Here's a cylinder seal from the 4th millennium B.C., Looks like it's got dinosaurs on it. Isaiah chapter 14 talks about a fiery, flying serpent. Homer talks about large serpents that can fly who had wings. Uh, not Homer, but Herodotus, who was a contemporary of Homer. He talks about large, flying serpents who had wings that uh, were like a bat's wings. Be some kind of pterodactyl. The place where the bones lie at the entrance of the narrow gorge between the mountains... And, the wing, and with, the spring, with the spring, the winged snakes come flying from Arabia toward Egypt. Lots of people talk about these kind of things. Josephus tells the story of Moses. He's, he wrote the Jewish Antiquities, the history of the Jews, some stuff you don't find in the Bible. He wrote the story of Moses using a certain kind of birds to fight off the flying serpents that would attack. Kind of interesting. It's like he was fighting pterodactyls. In AD 793, they talked about the fiery dragons flying across the firmament in an Anglo-Saxon chronicle. People writing about dinosaurs, people depicting dinosaurs and dragons all over the place. Job 41:19, out of his mouth go burning lamps and sparks of fire, talking about Leviathan, the great serpent. Out of his nostrils go with smoke, as of a seething pot or cauldron. Maybe he was just smoking a cigarette. I don't know. <laughs> His breath kindleth coals, and a flame goeth out of his mouth. More about Leviathan in a few minutes and behemoth. Here's dragons depicted and lions depicted in Babylon. Now, those of you who've deployed have probably seen this when you went to Iraq. How many have been to Iraq? A couple of y'all. You might have gone to Babylon and saw this. It's a model of the Ishtar Gate in modern Iraq. It's the entrance to the rebuilt city. People knew about dinosaurs in 600 B.C. and put them on their city walls. Alexander the Great talked about sending his soldiers to India where they encountered dragons in caves. Here's some more. A mosaic showing two long-necked dragons. I don't know if they're fighting or maybe that would be necking. I'm not sure. Here's St. George slaying a dragon. This is even depicted. My wife and I went to Slovenia a couple of years ago and we got to see a big depiction of 
in one of the chapels there of St. George slaying a big dragon. Beowulf slew many dragons. It's the story of Beowulf killing what seems like, if you read the description, kind of seems like a, a T-Rex pulling its arms off, its small arms off, and the creature bleeds to death. Here's a Babylonian cylinder seal. Looks like some kind of dragon on there. In AD 900, an Irish writer told of an animal with iron nails in its tail, with a head similar to a horse. Maybe he saw some kind of dinosaur. The Viking woodcut of a dragon swallowing a man. You know, Vikings used to put dragons on the front of their ships all the time. Why do you think they would do that? Probably because other people, enemies, might expect to see a sea serpent every now and then. It might scare them away. They saw some things like that. Here's Siegfried slaying a dragon, Fafnir. Why would people put dinosaurs on their castle walls if they had not seen real ones? Why would they put them there? Marco Polo lived in China for 17 years, around 1271 AD, and reported that the emperor raised dragons to pull chariots and parades. They even had a report in 1611 of a royal dragon feeder. What do you think his job was? To feed the dragons. They use their blood for medicines, dragon blood for medicines, raised dragons, just like some of you guys raise sheep and goats and some other things. Maybe that's the cowboy church that does that stuff. So why would people put dinosaurs on their tombs if they had not seen dinosaurs? Those are 15th century, pretty good depictions of dinosaurs. Maybe it looks like they might have seen some of them. Some more artwork, lots of coins. There's lots of artifacts that just have dinosaurs all over them. Here's a triceratops that was seen in France. Somebody wrote about that. They had seen it. In the Grand Canyon, there's, an, there's a Native American pictograph in the Havasupai Canyon in the Grand Canyon. They were probably being chased around by velociraptors or something. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe Jurassic Park wasn't too far off. Now listen to what this guy says about this drawing in the Grand Canyon. The fact that some prehistoric man made a pictograph of a dinosaur on the walls of this canyon upsets completely all of our theories regarding the antiquity of man. Facts are stubborn and immutable things. If theories do not square with the facts, then the theories must change and the facts remain. I agree with that guy. I agree with him. Look what this other person says. About a year ago, a photograph of a dinosaur, a photograph of a dinosaur, was shown to a scientist of national repute who was then specializing in dinosaurs. He said, it's not a dinosaur, it's impossible. Because we know the dinosaurs were extinct 12 million years before man appeared on Earth. Does he know that? Why would he say that? This is an example of a theory getting in the way of science. People say evolution is science. No, evolution is a belief and here, it is stopping this guy from understanding and assimilating empirical evidence. The science textbook is going to talk about dinosaurs 65 million years ago. When it comes to the age of the earth, you know, 1770, George Buffin said the earth was 70,000 years old. In 1905, the official age was 2 billion years old. In 1969, it became 3.5 billion years old. And today, it is 4.6 billion years old. If you add that up, it means that the earth is aging at 40 years per minute. Just saying, that's science for you. Here's some natural bridges in State Park, and there's some petroglyphs, depictions on the, on the rocks, and that's what that one looked like. Why would he draw that if he hadn't seen an animal like that? Here's an aboriginal cave painting of a guy running from what looks like a dinosaur. Here's some aborigines running around a dinosaur trying to stab it, looks like it swallowed one of their buddies. Got a man inside. All those drawings, all those depictions, all those statues, yet the textbook says no human being has ever seen a live dinosaur. Why would he say that? Now did he not look at any of the evidence that I've just shown you and there's a lot more? Is he ignorant? Or is he pushing an agenda? Is he biased? Why would somebody write that? In Ica, Peru, they have something called Ica stones. They have depictions of dinosaurs all over the Ica stones. Now, you have to know if you look this up on the internet that when this became famous, when this broke the news, lots of people started making fake Ica stones. 
So the atheists will argue with you and try to say that the Ica stones are all fake. They're not all fake, but there are some fake ones out there. But these guys go to Ica, Peru every year and find more stones. They have found thousands of these things. Ica stones with depictions of dinosaurs all over them, people doing things with them. Here's a guy cutting off one of them's head. Here's a guy riding one. Dinosaurs all over these stones. So why are they depicting dinosaurs? You can even see the circles where the skin had scales on it. Dinosaur skin. Some of these Ica stones. They even found T-Rex soft tissue. Blood. I'll tell you right now, that is not millions of years old. Can't possibly be. So no human being has ever seen a live dinosaur. What about the guys in Ica, Peru? You think they saw a live dinosaur? What about these Roman artifacts found in 1925 that have dinosaurs drawn on them? You know, Columbus was not the first man across the ocean. There's some other people came before, and we find their artifacts all the time. We found some Roman swords that have dinosaurs on them. So if all this is true about man living with dinosaurs, dinosaurs living with man, are dinosaurs mentioned in the Bible? Does anybody know where dinosaurs are mentioned in the Bible? Okay. One person? A couple? I'm sure some of you all know it. Here's a couple dinosaurs right here. In the book of Job, the Job is uh, a book about a guy named Job. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. And that man was perfect and upright and one that feared God and eschewed evil. He hated evil. Job was probably written right around this time in history. They think the writers of the book of Job, or his companions, were contemporaries with Jacob and Esau. And if you keep reading the book of Job, by the time you get to chapter 40, it says, Behold now, behemoth, Job chapter 40, which I made with thee. See that? He eateth grass like an ox. If you look in the, some of your study Bible notes, you'll see little comments in there. It says that, oh, it was an elephant or a hippopotamus. But if you keep reading, it couldn't be an elephant or a hippopotamus. A hippopotamus. It could have been something else, like an apatosaurus, brachiosaurus, a cetiosaurus, or perhaps a, a, a blondosaurus. You know, I'd be real slow with those. Behold now, behemoth, which he made with thee, he eateth grass like an ox. There's a description right there. He has a strength in his loins, and the force is in the navel of his belly. Well, there's some animals that might fit that. That guy's got a big belly. Hippopotamus has a big belly. And Apatosaurus has a big belly. He has a big belly. So does he. He moveth his tail like a cedar. Have you ever seen a cedar tree? Possibly a hippopotamus or an elephant. Do their tails look like a cedar? No. Could not be a hippopotamus or an elephant. His bones are as strong as pieces of brass. His bones are like bars of iron. There's a Brachiosaurus toe bone right there. The guy standing next to a Brachiosaurus leg. You might call that guy Bigfoot. <laughs> That's a big, tall leg. Here's a dinosaur footprint in Glen Rose, Texas, and a kid taking a bath in it. That's pretty tall. It's a big animal right there. They wouldn't grow to be that big in today's, in today's environmental conditions. The biggest one ever found is 100 tons. That's, that's 14 school buses. If he stepped on you, you would be deeply impressed. Finally, you guys are waking up a little bit. <laughs> he is the chief of the ways of God. The chief of the ways of God. The beginning, the principal thing. He's the chief of the ways of God. He that made him can make a, um, and he that made him can make his sword approach unto him. And God created great whales and every living creature that moveth. God created the dinosaurs. Satan couldn't fool Adam about the dinosaurs. He named them. Satan couldn't fool Noah about the dinosaurs. He fed them every day on the ark. But over the next 4,000 years, most of the dinosaurs died or were killed off by man. And notice I say most. We're not going to have time to cover this, but I actually have a lot of material over dinosaurs that stu could still be alive today. They're not growing to be nearly as big because of the atmospheric conditions, but they might not be extinct after all. In 1809, most dinosaurs were gone and people had forgotten about them. And then you can bring in this evolution theory and dupe everybody. And in the textbooks, we can read about dinosaurs and it'll say millions of years ago. How many kids are being taught this in our town? 
Just about all of them, probably. And what are we doing about it? We're paying for it. That's what we're doing about it. Millions of years ago, this is what the kids see every day. They go to the museums millions of years ago. Millions of years ago. The Bible keeps going in Job chapter 40. He lieth under the shady trees in the covert of the reed and the fens. Fens is the archaic word for swamp. In Lukuala, I think that's how you pronounce that, swamp in the Congo in Zaire is about 50,000 square miles. For scale, you see how big that is? You think America's big. You think driving across Texas is big. <laughs> Try living in Africa for a while. Okay. We know some missionary friends that live in Africa, and when they have to take a trip somewhere, it is quite a trip. They've got to drive for a while to get there. So 80% of that is unexplored, yet there are stories. Here's a 43-year veteran missionary, Eugene Thomas, had two pygmies in his mission in Congo, Africa, that claim they have killed a Mokalea Mbembe, which looks like about a 20-foot apatosaurus. Not going to be quite as big, but still alive today. And they're still there, and they can tell the stories. So dinosaurs are mentioned in the Bible as dragons, but could some still be alive today? Here's a shipwreck washed up on the shipwrecks and sea monsters. This monster washed up on the shore of California. You can kind of see him in the outline there. You can kind of see his bulbous head there. And his neck was about 20 feet long. And this expert said, well, I studied it, and I think it's some type of plesiosaur. That's what a plesiosaur looks like right there. He had a neck that was 20 foot long, and that head there looks about like the one they found there. Back in the 1920s. Somebody said, you creationists are so stupid, don't you know that was just a beached whale? Would you show me the neck on a whale? <laughs> that could not have been a whale. Let me ask you a question. Did God call you to do this? say, do what? Talk about what I'm talking about. And the reason I ask that is because today, kids are being misled from the time they're real little that the Bible is not true, and they get taught that science con contradicts the Bible, and it doesn't. And what are we doing about it? We just let it happen. We even pay for it. Well, I'm telling you, it's time we started fighting back. It's time we start doing something about it. It's time we get more involved with the good news clubs and other ministries like that where we can fight back against this tide of falsehood and deception that is leading people astray every day. We can do something about it. This stuff about evolution is the primary reason people don't think the Bible is true. We have to do something about it. The Bible tells us to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He already gave the orders. All we have to do is to figure out the details to get the jo job done. How are we going to preach the gospel to every creature? And I think there's a clue in the book of Acts. And I'm going to explain to you why I'm doing this creation series and why I think every one of us should be involved in some kind of ministry where we confront our culture every day about this stuff. There are two great sermons in the book of Acts. Maybe three if you count Acts 7. But Peter preaches one in Acts chapter 2. But Paul preaches one in Acts chapter 17. Now he's preaching to people who have never heard of the Bible before. Never read it, don't know it, not really familiar with it. Peter was preaching to people who already believed in the God of the Jews. So he already had a starting place. If you're witnessing to somebody who's unsaved but going to church, at least they believe in God, at least they believe in the Creator. You already have something going for you. But if you start witnessing to people who are atheistic and completely don't believe in the Bible at all, or any of it, you kind of have some hurdles to cross. Well, Paul does it here. He's dealing with some folks who do not believe in the Bible at all, or in the God of the Bible. So Paul stands on Mars Hill, and he says, I perceive that ye men of Athens are too superstitious. I see all these altars here, but there's this altar here to the unknown God. That's the God I want to tell you about. This is the God that made the world and all things therein. When Paul is dealing with heathens who don't understand anything about the Bible, he starts at creation. And he explains it from the very beginning. In the beginning of this earth, the beginning of creation, I want to tell you about the God who made everything you see. 
That's where he has to start. And if we're going to successfully engage our culture, there are lots of roadblocks. Sometimes people aren't just ready to hear about Jesus Christ because they don't believe the Bible in the first place. They don't believe that guy can save them. There's no credibility in the Bible to them. That's why we have to engage. We have to be able to present this information in a way where people can understand it, just conversationally, if nothing else. So what can you do to help confront the culture? Well, maybe you can see how many people you can get to watch videos, like the ones we put on YouTube. And there's lots more out there, too, if you don't like my stuff. <laughs> okay? My stuff's all borrowed from somebody else anyway. But you can get, see, send out links, make DVDs for people, pass out videos on campus, on, at, uh, at schools, see how many campuses you can get kicked off of. Put videos in your public library. Many people have done this already. Have a dino night at church. Get a trailer, a truck, or a tent. Travel to parks and beaches and projects and malls and fairs like these people do. They have an inflatable dino cave and they travel around and invite all the kids to come in and learn about dinosaurs in the dino cave. Some of y'all sitting around with a little extra time on your hands, a little extra money, you can invest in a ministry like this and you could do a lot to stem the tide against the evolution that's being taught to the kids, the lies that are being taught. Last time I lived here, we used to hold a we used to hold a weekly meeting at our house for a little while, for about six or eight weeks or so, where we watched videos on creation, and I invited people from work sit around and eat popcorn and watch videos on creation, and it, and it was great. Uh, some people use puppets and flannel graft, but you got to think. You got to think of some ways to reach the kids in your area, because if you don't, Satan will. You can take your time to write books, plays, tracks, get on a radio, TV, or talk show, and. Uh, have a creation guest. Send, send them a video that they can play on some of the public channels. Get, get creation, give creation material as presents to people. Here, watch this. <laughs> Host a home creation study like we did. Get creation tapes on your cable TV. I guess that would be videos now or DVDs. Pass out creation tracks. There's all kinds of things that you can do. And if you're a Christian, what are you doing for God? I want to kind of point you and steer you in the right direction. You know, sometimes if you have kids... I think you're kind of like, I have kids, I've been a kid. And to a parent, it's obvious. It's obvious what the kids should be doing. You know, the clothes need to be folded. The kitchen needs to be cleaned. Your room needs to be cleaned. And they just walk right by it. And we do that so many, there's so many opportunities where we can serve God and we just walk right by them and don't see them. There's so many things we can be doing for God. So I want to challenge Christians. The stuff that we've been talking about today, that's the category that kids are being attacked today. That is the main lie by which Satan is deceiving our entire culture. And we can engage the culture. So, let's summarize real quick. God made the world. He owns it. He makes the rules. And we are guilty of breaking his rules. We could go through the Ten Commandments. We've seen this before. We've all done something wrong. We've all broken God's rules. We've all had hate in our hearts and done wicked things to other people. Thou art not a God that hath pleasure in the wickedness, neither shall evil dwell with thee. If you've got evil, and we all do, you can't go to live with God because he's holy. You're going to have to have something happen to that evil and get rid of it. We are guilty of breaking his rules, and we will be punished, or we must find a substitute to take our place. Jesus is willing and able to take our place. We sinned, and we're going to die and go to hell. Jesus Christ lived a perfect life, and he has paid for your sins by shedding his blood when he was crucified on the cross. And he rose again three days later. And by placing our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, we get that same righteousness that he lived. And we get eternal life, get to go to heaven and be with a holy God because his blood makes us holy. If the Bible is right about the beginning, it's right about the end. One day, Christ is coming back. One day, you're going to die. You're going to go somewhere. Where are you going to go when you die? Smoking or non-smoking? We say that kind of jokingly, but that's a very serious question. When you die, you're going to be dead for a long time. And there is no coming back. Whatever you do for Christ on this life, whether you choose Christ or deny Christ, has an eternal consequence. Jesus Christ loves you. He died for you. He shed his blood for you. And it's a free gift. If you receive him, you have eternal life with him and you can give your life to Christ, and he can do something with your life that will have eternal meaning. Christians, when you die, all you have is that dash here on this earth. What are you going to do with it? You're going to give it to God? You're going to live for the Lord? You're going to do something for him? 
I hope that you do. So what on earth are you doing for heaven's sake? 